heart of where innovation, money, and power collide in Silicon Valley and beyond. This is Bloomberg Technology with Caroline Hyde and Ed Ludlow. I'm Caroline Hyde of Bloomberg's World Headquarters in New York. And I'm also in New York, Ed Ludlow here, and this is Bloomberg Technology. Coming up, look, we'll take a look at what we can expect from Tesla's deliveries report. As is, analysts are slashing estimates as the quarter comes to a close. Details ahead. Plus more momentum in the IPO market as Microsoft-backed Rubrik says it's ready to file for its initial public offering. We'll bring you the latest. And we will sit down with the production company Shy Kids as they produce an entire short film using OpenAI's Sora. We'll have that and so much more coming up throughout the hour first. Let's check in on these markets. And, well, after a stellar first quarter, Ed, we're just paring back a little bit across the benchmarks. NASDAQ still clinging on to the gains, but look, only by one point at the moment. What is driving some of the perhaps sell-off in the equities on the day, at least, has been the movement in the bond market. Ten-year yields spiking at 11 basis points in the 10-year, but we're across the, up across the curve. 4.31 is where we're currently trading. Why? Factory orders coming in a surprise gain and really showing that this is a strong U.S. US economy and therefore the Fed really doesn't have to be cutting rates anytime soon. Bitcoin currently under pressure off by 2.8% but still really t- relatively higher at 68,827. But put it into context, Ed. Look at where we have come for this year alone on the S&P 500 despite those moves in bond yields throughout the year. Yeah, it's been a fast start to 2024, the first quarter, the first back-to-back quarterly gain since mid of last year, June quarter of last year. But I'm trying to find what, what, what are the commonalities between yeah. all of these gains at the indices level and I think the answer is NVIDIA basically, <laughs> yeah, basically along with some other AI names that were caught up in the kind of infrastructure play and now the attention's fo- focusing well if rates are going to come down which rate sensitive sectors do you want to be in and does that mean moving away from tech which is sad for us yeah. but it might be savvy for others and to be honest savvy on the day and on the year to date we're still seeing chip so- sector absolutely flying one and a quarter percent higher on the day we've got analysts out there upgrading the stocks to the likes of Micron it yes. isn't just of course, the star performer that has always been NVIDIA, but this has started to spread. And where else has been really the beneficiaries? And later in the program, we also have to talk about our risk asset of choice, which is Bitcoin, because mm-hmm. there is something that is due to happen on the calendar, the halving. I think it's important to understand that. But broadly speaking, uh, every week I have a sense of deja vu because we always say, oh, will the, the, the Fed cut rates or when will they cut rates and in which increment? And then we go from there and see how it impacts the technology sector. We used to say higher rates discount the present value of future cash flows. But I'm reading this note from City Strategies yeah. saying, actually, we're thinking about where we need to move outside of technology. What role Bitcoin plays in that as well? No idea. Yeah, spread the love. Meanwhile, Jupiter of Fund over in Asia is still saying, look, get in on the AI play, go in on those sorts of names that you still have seen so outperform. So it feels as though the artificial intelligence run-up still has some space to run. But there is one stock, Ed, yes. that has really fallen afoul this year so far. It was a magnificent seven player, and it's anything but magnificent at the moment. And just before we came on air, the declines in the moment really ex- accelerated. Tesla's down 2.5%. We are bracing for first quarter deliveries, mm-hmm where the expectation is that they will deliver around 457,000. Sequentially, quarter on quarter, that would mean a 6% decline. The big one to watch is like, look at how wide the estimates are. At the lower end, this could be the first time in years that Tesla's seen a drop year on year in deliveries growth. And we know all about the factors, higher rates, the consumer's not interested anymore, domestic competition in China, there is a lot for us to discuss. And to discuss it, Corey Cantor, analyst at Bloomberg NEF, covering vehicle electrification, joins us here in New York. I mean, uh, this is an important quarter, but the first quarter of 2024 kind of summed up the EV story. Are you in the concerned about Tesla camp? I think I'm in the wait and see how Tesla does. And if you look at the market globally, it's getting more competitive. The number that really watch is that 423,000 units. I could see Tesla being pretty flat. We've seen in the U.S., for example, Model That's what they did in the first quarter of 2023. 2023, Year on year being flat. Even, you know, you've seen some estimates of a decline of about three percentage points as a possibility, down to about 410,000. Deutsche Bank had Tesla at 414,000 deliveries. Um, I would bet more on probably the, I'd say, bearish delivery side, just because of the number of issues they've had. You look at not only China and competition there, but in Europe, Tesla's uh, Gigafactory in Berlin saw a slowdown due to some uh, outside side issues that Elon Musk flew over there to help uh, deal with afterwards. So you look at China, a lot of competition here in the U.S., Model 3 refresh, Europe, 
issues, so nowhere is going particularly well. Um, that being said, Tesla is still likely to outpace BYD in terms of its fully electric vehicle sales this quarter, given, you know, even if Tesla hits about 400,000 right. units. Let's go into the context here. Yeah. If we do see an actual year-on-year -year decline, how unheard of is that for Tesla? The last time that happened to Tesla was in 2020 during the pandemic. Right. And then I went back in the data, and before that, you have to go back to 2014 to see a slight decline year-on-year. In general, it's been flat, or Tesla has seen a lot of growth on a year-on-year -year basis. Elon Musk has said we're in between two waves, and so the question is, you know, what happens this quarter, and then what does Tesla do to correct it moving forward? Mm. Um, because again, they haven't given a kind of guidance of delivery for the full year, which you typically see, see automakers do, um, and you want to see that reassurance if you're looking for the EV sector to grow. Tesla was about 46% of U.S. EV sales, which was actually the lowest uh, in 2023 on basis, so they're becoming less important to the health of the overall U.S. EV market, but still important to the global EV market. Okay, last Thursday in the Bay Area in an undisclosed <laughs> location, I went and picked up a Model Y. Uh -huh. I did it. I leased one. I leased one because I needed a new car, but also it was astonishing. The federal uh, tax credit in the lease context, but also Tesla's own incentives. They always do this at the end of a quarter, mm -hmm. and they warned us that April 1st prices would go back up. They did. I woke up this morning and checked the website. They made a good deal. <laughs> But you talked about between two waves. I, I debated, as you know, because we discussed it for a really long time, do I need a, what Model Y? Does the Model Y work for me? I think on balance it did. For many consumers out there, this is really complicated. They look at the, the vehicles Tesla offers and say, I don't know that I want a Model 3 or Model Y. I can't afford an S and X and right. Cybertruck. Don't even get me started. Well, there's only so many Cybertrucks being built yet. Yeah, you've got to get on the pre-order list. I think the other issue is you look at the Model Y and the Model 3, they're really close in price now. They are. So if you are looking at a three, why not just spend a little bit more for the Y for more legroom and more space? With the next generation Tesla vehicle announced for production sometime next year, you want to make sure you're not cannibalizing the three. Because right now, the Y is the best value out there. Not just in the US, one of the best selling vehicles in the world. But then let's get that broader context of competition. You mentioned BYD and right. how they're managing to ramp up in terms of market share. But over in Europe, you know, you've got BMW coming out with some really extraordinary electric vehicles. Overall, is is competition now something really Tesla has to be sitting up and aware of? Yes. I think China, it's the most intense. China, you've got a bunch of different automakers competing in a real way, and consumers there. I think BYD has even said that EV sales should be about 50% of all car sales in China in the next coming few months. Um, everywhere else, Tesla has a bit more of an advantage in terms of time, but everywhere it's ramping up. I'm looking forward to those BMW EVs next year. That should be the uh, new class making waves. And they're big here in the U.S. too. I mean, they were about 20% of all BMW sales last year in the U.S. were electric. So it's not just a Europe thing, not just a China thing. Tesla has competition everywhere, and that's a big difference from a couple years ago. Corey Cantor giving individual advice to Ed on what car he should or shouldn't be driving, but also you can check him out on Bloomberg NEF. He has some great analysis across EVs. Meanwhile, coming up, Chief Experience Officer at Ledger, Ian Rogers, joining us. Tell us what we can expect out of the Bitcoin halving. I'm also sticking with the EV sector for a minute. Nikola, the maker of battery electric, electric and hydrogen fuel cell trucks, is down a percentage point, but it had been up as much as 16% in pre-market, 10% at the open. The current management team is suing disgraced founder and CEO, former CEO Trevor Milton, who himself was trying to get new board members who are his friends on the board and has been sentenced to four years in prison. I don't know if he's litigating this from prison, but this is a wild stock that you want to be following. We're trying to get more details. We'll keep an eye on it. This is Bloomberg Technology. crypto, Bitcoin to be specific, because every so often the formula that governs the rate at which new Bitcoin tokens are created, but it changes. These events, they're called halvings, are a planned reduction in the rewards that miners receive and happen once every four years or so. Now, after the last three halvings, the coin hit records. So both skeptics and supporters, they're watching this particular move closely to see what will come of the event and the price point more specifically. Let's get to Chief Experience Officer at Ledger. It's Ian Rogers joining us really on your take. I mean, your business is all about ultimately the consumer side and, and the buying and security of crypto. When you're thinking of the halving, are you expecting everyone's going to be a flurry of anticipation to have more, to own more as the supply becomes more limited and it does drive up the price? 
Well, I think the, the having is a great opportunity for people to learn more about what Bitcoin is and, and how it works. You know, Bitcoin, it's uh, designed to mimic precious metals in that the more you mine it, the more difficult it becomes to mine. And going into this having is we have an unprecedented setup um, because we have hit an all time high on a weekly, monthly and quarterly basis, um, you know, prior to the having, which is something that hasn't happened before. In the times that's happened previously, after you have, um, you know, this this weekly, monthly, quarterly all time high, you've had an appreciation of 300 percent. Right. Um, so, you know, the setup, the setup of the having is is interesting because, you know, it's it's a you know financial endeavor for the miners. And you can learn a lot from watching what the miners are doing going into the having and they've been investing so they've obviously been betting on um betting their businesses on the price of of bitcoin going up and it, it looks like they're about to win their bet I, I like the comparison with literal mining of of metals or commodities call it what you will and i find those data points interesting you're when you say machines i think you mean the compute right to run this and you, you're also focused on the hash rate which has been accelerating why are those data points that you're following well, because what you're what you're doing, and, and if you're looking to the miners to see what they think is going to happen after the halving, then then what you're doing is you're saying, okay, well, what's the break-even point for them? So at the current, um, you know, at, at the at the current uh, rate of bitcoins being created, which is about 900 per day, the break-even point for them is a $32,000 bitcoin. Um, so they've been investing uh, all year long, even knowing that after the halving, the break-even point for them will be $64,000 Bitcoin. So even you know, back in January, when the price of Bitcoin was between forty dollars and $50,000, they were still investing, betting that the price of Bitcoin would surpass that, that $64,000 mark. So now Bitcoin's you know, hovering around $70,000. $70, and then what you have is, again, as I said, you, had, you have about 900 Bitcoins being created on a daily basis. After the halving, that will go down to 450 Bitcoins being created on a daily basis, but you have this um, this new event, which is the Bitcoin ETFs, which are driving a demand of around 2,500 Bitcoins every day. So, you know, there will only ever be 21 million Bitcoin, 19 and a half million of those are already in existence. All of those have come into existence via this mining process. Um, and if you just look at the at the supply side, we've said we've had, you know, kind of a um, you know, we, we've had this uh, this demand that's been created by the ETFs, um, and then now you're about to have the supply shock of mm -hmm. the having. So I think you know it's it's um, it's very you know very simple supply and demand, and and you know and also now you know Bitcoin's been around for 15 years. So a it's been hardened, um, and we've had a long time to look at it, and we've looked at these cycles many times. So you know there's no no guarantee that the past will predict the future. Um, as I said, we've never had this all-time high in advance um, of the ETF, uh, I mean, I'm sorry, in advance of yeah. the having the, e the ETF is a new way to buy Bitcoin. So there's a lot here that's unprecedented, yeah. um, you know, but but we're definitely looking at past cycles to try to predict the future. And we are asking a lot of your own uh, expertise in this domain. And I wonder just how decentralized is m the mining community at this moment? How much are they able to be redeploying yet further and further capital into compute, into, well, ultimately, um, the economics that you just walked us through? Well, it's, it's, I mean, it's, it's global. Um, it chases cheap energy, um, you know, because the, you know, the cheaper that you can, they can run the mining operation, um, you know, the more profitable you can become. Also, you know, the, the compute that, that drives mining, you know, has, uh, has improved tremendously between the last cycle and this cycle. So, you know, it, it is a, it is a, it's a, it's a global business, but again, these are, these are, um, these are businesses, right? So, you know, the question is, what will they do after the halving? You know, how much of the Bitcoin that they've mined will they need to sell and then put into the market? Will they be able to keep their machines online because it's profitable to do so? Or will they need to unplug some of their machines because the profitability has gone down? Um, so, you know, th that's why it's it's super interesting to, to continue to keep an eye on the mining business and to see what investments they're making and what bets they're making. We're, we're talking about the halving because it's due in April. Uh, look, we've had a pretty robust debate in the last week, Ian, with Jack Mallers, who was on the program, the Strike CEO, Mike Novogratz came on the show last week and made the same argument. They basically in the camp of there's only 21 million Bitcoin ever and therefore price only go up, Bitcoin go up uh, for that very simple reason. But one of the interesting data points that I track at least is liquidity in the market. You know, I, I get it on the supply side, but there's a lot of trading that goes on basically. Uh, 
Are you in the camp of only 21 million Bitcoin ever, so it only go up? Well, I'm in the camp of um, we lead digital lives and we will have digital ownership in our digital lives. And there is a new invention here. I mean, that's that's what people often kind of overlook. They look at only the speculative side. But, you know, I've been working on the Internet since the early 90s and um, I did digital music for 20 years. And I was a big part of the fact that you no longer own your music collection. You rent it. Um, So Bitcoin has been the tip of the spear of digital ownership. Um, And. I think that you know that you know we will have digital ownership in our digital lives and and yes because you have this this truly scarce digital ownership asset, which is like, a, it behaves like a precious metal. Um, I think look if you own pesos, you want to own dollars, and if you own dollars, you want to own Bitcoin. Ledger Chief Experience Officer Ian Rogers, great to catch up with you. It is time for Talking Tech. And first up in the news, Huawei continued its run of strong quarterly profit growth, building on the resurgence of its consumer business against Apple's iPhone and the rise of its cloud division against Alibaba. The Chinese networking and electronics company reported net profit of about $2 billion US dollars in the December quarter, according to Bloomberg's calculations. That's up more than 65% from a year earlier. Plus, OpenAI plans to open an office in Tokyo in April as the AI pie begins to build out its international operations. The office will be its first in Asia and the third international location after the company opened offices in London and Dublin last year. All of that according to Bloomberg sources. And AT&T said personal data from about 73 million current and former customers was leaked onto the dark web, which prompted the company to reset 7.6 million account passcodes. The data, which also included 65.4 million former customers hit the dark web about two weeks ago, but the leaked data also includes personal information like social security numbers. It appears to be from 2019, that time period or earlier. The source of the data is still being investigated and it's not known whether the data came from the company or it came from a third party vendor. Caro? Yeah, we want to dig into this story a lot more now. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst John Butler joins us and AT&T itself rushing to proactively be talking to customers affected. But more broadly, how heard or unheard of is this sort of amount of a leak of things such as your social security numbers? So that's actually a great question. And the answer is security breaches for the carriers are actually more common than you would think. Uh, T-Mobile sort of leads the pack with um, with several dating back to uh, August of 2021 and even earlier. But they had one of similar size back in August of 2021. And what's interesting is it really didn't impact confidence in the brand at the time. So we looked at subscriber churn, how many subscribers left the brand after T-Mobile's breach? Um, Did it affect net additions, new people coming to the brand uh, in the wake of the breach? And the answer is it really didn't, it wasn't that impactful to them. And so our call on AT&T is something similar. We don't think this is really going to dent the brand in a major way in the wake of this incident. That, that's the thesis that you, you outline in your Bloomberg Intelligence React. There's going to be a lot of AT&T, AT&T customers, John, that are watching this show thinking, what is John Butler talking about? They got access to my information. Um, how quickly was the response from AT&T to get this resolved and under wraps? So. I think once it was out, it was they made all the right moves, right? They're offering subscribers uh, reimbursement for any security like LifeLock that they want might want to add uh, onto their accounts. Um, and there were also they reached out to everyone and changed their passcode. So again, from the basic blocking and tackling standpoint, I think they're they're doing all the right things. Mm-hmm. Uh, Inklings of this leak, so to speak, go all the way back to 2019. Um, there was sort of a rumor uh, out that um, a bad guy had gotten the AT&T data, but it had not been dumped onto the dark web at that point. So AT&T really didn't have any data to work with to verify whether it had or had not been leaked. Yeah. And I think I'd add that there's still question as to whether it was leaked 
or stolen from AT&T or stolen from one of its vendors. Yeah, AT&T denied that it was a victim of a data breach back in 2019 when it was Sky Shiny Hunters that claimed to have stolen the personal data and they indeed said that the stolen information didn't come from its own systems. But John, this isn't a great look after what happened just last month, right? Well, actually back in, I think it was, yeah, now March, when they had a huge outage as well. I mean, there's going to be a few slightly frustrated customers right now. Yeah, the timing is tough. I think in the immediate wake of this, there could be a, a little bit of blowback uh, for AT&T in terms of, you know, its, uh, its brand reputation. Uh, it's never lasting. That's the interesting thing. I, I'd point out the best test case to, is Rogers, which is Canada's largest uh, internet provider. I'm sorry, wireless provider. And they had a huge internet outage uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, yeah. And it was really substantial. Uh, it took down, I think, over a third of the country for several days. And they actually had no impact in terms of net additions or, right. or impact to the brand. So people forget this pretty quickly. Um, and I expect uh, no different for AT&T. Bloomberg Intelligence Analyst John Butler, great to have you back on the program, John. It's been a while. Welcome back to Bloomberg Technology. Ed Ludlow here alongside Caro in New York City. Yeah, so nice to have you here. And meanwhile, we are getting you up to speed with what's happening in the markets right here, right now. And more broadly, we're coming off of those highs. But Ed, after what has been a phenomenal start to the year, and in fact, phenomenal six months, I mean, let's call it, Dece the December quarter was up 14% from the Nasdaq 100. And we see the Nasdaq 100 pulling out another 8.5% rally in the first quarter of the year. Today, we take a breather. We're up just five points, but the rest of the benchmarks are on the downside. Why? Well, we blame the 10-year yield largely and some strong economic data. Once again, the U.S. is just managing to outperform factory orders this time, pushing up rates because why? We think that the Federal Reserve isn't going to have to cut rates. If we've got such a strong economic picture here. 11 basis, 12 basis points, let's call it higher on the 10-year yield. Bitcoin, as along with other risk assets, is just giving off a little bit today. We're up down almost 3%, so accelerating some of those losses. 68,760, though, can't be sniffed at after a phenomenal quarter for that particular asset. Move over, look over at what's happening in some of the individual names and actually when you've got a day like this where potentially volumes are relatively thin because like, the rest of the world is taking a day off uh, due to Easter Monday as it's known over in Europe volumes are down about 11% if you're looking at the S&P 500 and we're seeing the micron though the outperformer up 6.5% why? Because the analyst likes it and they're saying look this is an integral play for your AI future so they're liking micron and shares moving on the back of analyst reports Alphabet get this hitting a new record high for Google we're up almost 3% Tesla on the downside though and we continually continue to anticipate the deliveries for Tesla and whether or not they could actually be a year-on-year -year decline. Ed. Let's go to the IPO market. Rubrik, a cloud and data security startup backed by Microsoft, is planning to file as soon as next week, that according to sources. Here's what Rubrik CEO told us back in December when he was last on the show. We asked him about it. We are uh, focused again on uh, building a long-term business. I'll leave the IPO to the experts. I can't comment on it. Uh, Caro and I have been asking people senior about an IPO for a very long time now. Let's get more with Bloomberg's deals reporter, Ryan Gould. What do we know about Rubrik, the moves they're making to get listed? Uh, yes, that's right. I realized that was just before Christmas when he said that, December 22nd. It's interesting. We reported last year in September that the company was planning to raise around up to 700 million, we thought at the time. Again, I think market conditions have really sort of blown out since then. If you look at what Astera and Reddit did uh, a couple of weeks ago, um, as you say, expected to file this week, uh, as soon as this week for a uh, IPO, they could flip that S1 public. And Ed, I think this would be yet another test for IPOs, its security. Uh, it's a very different profile to the sort of thing that we saw with Reddit. Uh, it's not chips. Um, so it'll, it'll be interesting to see how this, uh, how this one plays out. Cloud data security. It is, though, back by Microsoft, which, of course, has been very much the, the darling of choice in the public markets, Ryan. Do we get a sense of valuation here already or sort of the size and scope of appetite for companies like this? 
Caroline, I think valuation is a little bit up in the air right now. But I mean, if you think to the to the round that Microsoft invested in, I think just to double check my notes, 2021, that was at $4 billion. I mean, this is a sector that has proven very resilient. I think if you look across at the financial sponsor activity in this space, you know, you're seeing multiples that are significantly 20 times sort of forward EBITDA for some of these kinds of assets. Um, so I think when this sort of comes around, should they flip and, you know, you have the 15 day cooling off period, uh, it'll be interesting to see the investor reception to the results. Yeah. Uh, you know, they're going to disclose whether they're loss making. I think that's still the sense. Uh, but exactly by how much? Uh, these are the kinds of questions that investors will be pouring over uh, in the coming weeks. And of course, this is a liquidity event for employees. It's also for those that are backed at not only Microsoft, but Bain Capital Ventures, Coastal Ventures, some of the names that are put in early checks. Ryan, who else, therefore, what others in the VC community will be waiting with bated breath for the next set of names that we're likely to see after this? There are a bunch. I mean, if you think just after Reddit, now we're thinking about the likes of Ibotta. It does coupons. They're the types of, uh, it's the type of firm where you'll get deals at Walmart, uh, all of these big, big box retailers. Um, you've got uh, Turo that is still on the books. There's uh, Waystar that's owned by owned by AQT and I think still has some, some other investors of note there. Um, all that said, I think there is a significant backlog. I was talking to a couple of sources on the phone this morning who say that, you know, really the blowout performance of Astera and Reddit. If you look at Astera, it's up 94%. Reddit, even despite the declines last week, is still up 37% since its issue. These are giving every owner of a private company confidence to actually really test IPOs as an exit route. And therefore, you know, what does that mean versus a, strate- a, strate- a strategic sale? And they've got a political calendar to negotiate with and get out in front of. Ryan Gould, great to have you on. Thank you so much. Ed, what else are we watching today? We should talk about Disney. This Wednesday, my might bring the end, at least in this chapter, of Disney's proxy fight, with the company hosting its annual shareholder meeting and investors voting on efforts by activists to reshuffle the board. So I wrote today in the Tech Daily that this is about the streaming business, and Nelson Peltz wants a place on the board. The thing that I don't understand is what him getting on the board is going to do to fix streaming at Disney. Fortunately, Bloomberg's Felix Gillette is here <laughs> to answer the question for him. No, I'm yes. kidding. But that, that's what we're, we're talking about here, and yeah. this is what we're bracing for Wednesday. Yeah. It's basically a vote on strategy. Yeah. I mean, I think you look back since 2019 when Disney Plus launched, they've lost more than $10 billion on streaming, right? And those narr- losses have been narrowing, um, and you've seen some progress, but they still lost, what, $200 million last quarter. Um, um, you know, I think a lot of this vote is, yeah, do you trust Iger to do this on his own, or do you like having pelts there holding his feet to the fire? And I think with Disney, yeah, you have to look at where is the growth going to come to, where are these profits going to come from in the streaming side? Can they bundle these services mm. together in a compelling way? I mean, they're now integrating Hulu into the Disney Plus app. You have the question of, you know, right now you get ESPN Plus as part of that bundle. Uh, down the road at some point you'll get the full ESPN Plus flagship, presumably. Um, But that's a huge transition for ESPN to pull off. And at this point, um, yeah, that's one of the giant questions facing Iger and Disney. How close to the wire is this getting? Because I have been just bombarded by ads in every podcast I listen to, the ad in the every break, and sorry, it's because I still get ads delivered to me on my podcast, is that, you know, I should be out there trying to vote for Bob Iger and against Pelts. Yeah. They're coming to me as a consumer, and I'm interested as to how many consumers have gone out there and actually made their voices heard. I think it's the suspense has been building. I mean, it really looked like Iger was going to run away with this early on. He got these big endorsements, George Lucas. All right, the Lurie force Powell is strong drops. with Iger. Mm-hmm. Exactly, yeah. And then all of a sudden, you know, suddenly Peltz is making this comeback at the last minute. There's all these retail investors. Yeah, Disney has been blanketing these advertisements everywhere uh, <laughs> to try and get people on board with their slate. Um, it could go either way. I really think at this point, the stock is up, you know, 35% this year. It's been having a great year. Um, which, you know, Iger's made all these shareholder-friendly changes. But at the same time, he's been doing that with Peltz looking over his shoulder. Um, do you want to keep that arrangement going, or do you think it's he's done enough? I, I go back to the thesis I outlined in the column today, which is, like, what does Peltz do next if he gets put on the board? Because yeah. Iger has done quite a lot in yeah. recent times. Yeah. The, the, the tension in Florida seems to be going away. Yeah. They're teaming up with Warner Brothers and Fox on, on the sport side of things. 
How has that gone down with Disney's investor base? I think it's gone down well. I mean, all these changes, there's not a lot of difference between what Iger's strategy is and what yes. Peltz has said his strategy is. They've really right. converged over the past year. So at this point, I mean, the one thing I think, you know, is still open is the issue of succession, right? Yes. Like, uh, what's going to happen post Iger? Do you trust the current board to get it right this time? I think everybody agrees the last time around the board didn't really do much due diligence to try and keep, um, you know, Iger's succession plans on track. Um, and do you trust Peltz to be there and put more pressure on him this time around? Uh, Caro Roscoe was on the show last week and he said, if President Biden can run again for re-election, why can't Iger do another 10 years at Disney? That was one investor's thesis about what should happen next. Bloomberg's Felix Gillette, great to have you here in the studio. Now, coming up on the show, we're going to be joined by David Jones, founder and CEO of digital marketing group Brandtech, about their new raise. Real quick, look at shares of Trump Media and Technology Group. We got some financials, $4 million of revenue last year, but a loss of around $57 million. US dollars. Uh, the stock down accordingly 15%. Remember, this is uh, the D SPAC listing relevant to True Social. We'll keep tracking it. This is Bloomberg Technology. On today's VC Spotlight, guess what we're talking? generative AI, but we're talking in the marketing context here. Firm Brandtech is with us, just recently announced a Series C fundraise, $115 million. Here to discuss, well, where the funds are going and where generative AI is going. Brandtech CEO and founder David Jones, it is great to have you here in the studio with us, David. Another Brit, we're just slowly but surely <laughs> taking Thank over. You. <laughs> what are you using these funds for? How are you going to be scaling and making the most of this generative AI moment? So we launched the company in 2015 with a, a fundamental belief you could do all marketing better, faster and cheaper using technology and AI and machine generated content. And we've sort of been on a seven, eight year journey doing that. And it's just to continue that. So, you know, back in 2016, we invested in AI chatbots in 2017, AI media planning in 2018, AI mind twins. And then the last uh, major acquisition was Pencil, mm -hmm. which is the, the, according to Fast Company, the, one of the most innovative companies in the world and one of the leading Gen AI platforms in the world. So what we're talking about in present day is content, right, which is generative AI created. In other words, text to video in most cases or text to image where you're uh, at your computer and you say, dream me up a, an advertisement or another piece of marketing material based on these parameters and et voila, it's there. How quickly do you bring that to, to the marketplace? So Pencil very simply aggregates all of the, the latest and greatest Gen AI tools, and you can do everything from creating insights to pack shots to TikTok posts to YouTube videos to Instagram posts end-to-end. -end. It's predictive, so it will give you based on... I think the one thing that's really unique about it is we have a, a billion dollars of media spend across 5,000 brands since uh, 2018 and we've made a million generative AI ads, so that allows us to predict whether we think the content that's being created using the, the Gen AI platform is going to perform better, worse, or whether we don't have data around that. And it's interesting, people like to play with things that they don't have data on, because it's, I think marketeers, by definition, are optimistic. Um, <laughs> so literally, it's an end-to-end -end platform to allow you to create ads, um, and it typically does that with twice the performance, 10 times faster, and somewhere between 30 and 50% cheaper. As you say, you've been doing this since 2015. Now, some of the bigger juggernauts, and you come from having been the, I think, the youngest CEO ever in the in the advertising in, in the advertising space for Havas. Well, now it's WPP in on the act. Now we're seeing some of the others coming in and spending millions to try and catch up in generative AI. What makes you beat them? Look, I think if you look in history, um, it's never the big legacy business that succeeds post the revolution. You know, I think it's, it's incredibly complicated to take a business of 120,000 people and totally change what it does. I mean, I created the company in 2015 with technology at the core, machine generated and AI uh, content at the core. Uh, and I think it's really hard to, it's not, Totally impossible, but you know, Kodak didn't win in digital photography. IBM didn't win in uh, in, in mobile telephony. AOL isn't talked about too much in the internet space. Right. How 
engaged are the advertisers? Forget the agencies and the platforms. Caroline and I have talked a lot about the proximity of a brand to, it can be malicious content, it can be mislabeled content, but, but that's what we're talking about here. Great opportunity, but also heightened risk. Yeah. So look, I think at a big picture level, 100% of the headlines today are on Gen AI and less than 1% of the content is created using it. So I think we shouldn't lose sight of that. That said, I've never seen anything in my career like this in terms of the level of brand interest. I mean, it's literally, and you know, many of the big surveys have said that you know, over 60% of the global CEOs are saying it's going to impact our top and bottom line this year, not in the future. Mm. But obviously, it comes with issues. So I think you've got this incredible interest, and then it's OK, you know, what do we do about uh, copyright, how about data and privacy, how about bias, you know, there's a number of big issues and in fact when we built the, the pro product of Pencil, it was designed to circumnavigate all of those, but mm. you know, it's, there's a real learning curve going on for everyone and I think you often see brands go from sort of initially being concerned and as they understand more, I mean almost our general counsel is our kind of secret weapon in yeah. Gen AI, um, but so yeah, enormous interest but also some complexities. Talk about your See, you've got a new CFO. Mm. You're reportedly valued at about four billion. You're looking going public. Look, um, I'm very happy being a private company at the moment. Uh, you know, my, my kind of quote on this is I look at going to many places on holiday, but it's not because I look that I always, uh, you know, go there. Obviously, it's an option in the future, but so is staying private. You know, we're profitable, high growth, um, we're well funded. So we'll see. You know, I think uh, it's not something that is off the cards, but neither is it a plan. When you file the S1, we have that clip to play. <laughs> yeah, exactly. The next time uh, we appreciate your time though. Brand Tech CEO and founder, David Jones. They say everyone has something unique about them, something that sets them apart. It's just in my case, you know, it's quite obvious what that thing is. I am literally filled with hot air. Yeah, living like this has its challenges. Uh, windy days, for one, are particularly troublesome. <laughs> that was a clip from Airhead, a short film from Toronto-based multimedia production company, Shy Kids. It's one of the first short films made using OpenAI's Sora. Let's talk to the director of that short film. Walter Woodman joins us now with more. Uh, We've covered Sora. We've, we've talked about this in the context of the reaction to it. But Walter, let's start with the process, what it was like creating this short film using OpenAI's technology. Yeah, it's, it's very interesting. We, um, it, it's very similar to many of the processes we already use. Um, we're animators by trade, so we still had to go through the regular steps of you know, making a script, and um, then we would edit and animate and add sound and sound effects and things like that. The thing that really changed was most of what you see, the images were uh, generated using Sora. So, Walter, talk to us about ultimately the heavy lift or lack thereof of people. The hand wringing that goes on around generative AI, particularly around creative, is that it means fewer of you are needed. But is that true? What was the working process like? Yeah, I've read those Twitter comments as well. Um, and what I would say is that without 15 years of making films and um, tons of experience, I don't think that this would have happened. I think that our team is very adept at um, making films and while generating the images was slightly different than normally having to go out and shoot and grab things like that, um, it's still uh, a time intensive and human intensive process that requires several hands and several creatives. For this particular project, it was more on the side of editing and animating and um, I, would, I would more liken it to an animated process. Um, however, we're currently working on a sequel oh. and that's that's going to be more of a combination of live action with, um, with the actual animation. So um, that's more of a, a traditional workflow. Walter, why did you want to do this? Why did you want to get in on using Sora so quickly? I think uh, as filmmakers, every time you see something new, it's, it's an opportunity to expand your creativity and expand the things that you'd like to tell the world. And for us, 
We see this as an opportunity to, with a very you know, cute, fun, short film, showing people that it's not all doom and gloom, that there's actually hope for um, some positivity and, and that this technology is not something to be scared of, but something to work with. It is a short film about a young person with a balloon for a head, a metaphor for the fragility of human life, is my interpretation, <laughs> critic Ed Ludlow. But it's only one minute and 21 seconds long. And I think, is that the limitation here, that, that you are confined to very short clips at this stage, Walter? Well, we could put clips up to one minute. I think the thing is, though, is that you have to sort of curate what's the best, you know, 10 seconds or five seconds in the same way where you shoot everything. It took tons and tons of uh, generations and clips to get to one minute. So um, in terms of making something longer, I'm not the person who's going to say, this is it, it can only be one minute long. And in fact, the sequel already we're clocking in at about three or four minutes. And I think that it's a, a fool's errand to, um, to try to say how long these things can go for. But what I will say is that um, in order to get something that was cohesive for a minute, it required really you know, sifting through. The same way when you're making a documentary, you know, 90% of what you shoot gets uh, thrown on the floor. I would say it was a similar sort of burn rate for this. Walter Women, the director over at Shy Kids. It's a great watch. Go and have a look at it. We thank you so much. Looking forward to the sequel. Meanwhile, look, what a fascinating conversation ultimately about, well, we heard it from the advertising space, like not much doom and gloom on that. Jobs aren't going to be suddenly eradicated when you're using right. generative AI within advertising, but you're certainly going to see your job description change and, and used in different ways. And it feels as though this was pretty labor intensive, even if you are it using does. AI. It does. It allows you to be creative. The, the BTEC producer Marguerite Gallerini makes the point, when we played it out, you have to remember those are generative AI generated images. Yeah. But it's very convincing. Yeah. It's real. Um, and that's the takeaway for me. But a lot of work for less than 90 seconds. Yeah, exactly. And thus far, yes, I'm sure it gives you in a whole load of creative opportunity whether or not there's that much efficiency as yet in terms and of the making of it. A scoop that the sequel's coming and yeah. it will be four minutes long. So we'll get <laughs> back for that. I want to know what the name is now. Meanwhile, that does it for this edition of Bloomberg Technology. So great to have you in the house. Yeah, for one week only. Recap the show on the podcast. So many of you are tuning in. Maybe you're commuting into Manhattan or you're in the Bay Area listening or you're in London or Tokyo. Thank you for listening to the podcast on Apple, Spotify, iHeart and all the Bloomberg platforms. As we said, from New York City this week, this is Bloomberg Technology.